Hi everyone and welcome to part 3 of my Z80 computer series. In the last video I was building an EEPROM programmer and we added a ROM chip to the system which enabled us to run our very first program. So I wasn't totally happy with uh, how we could view the output because we were just looking directly at the data bus. Um, our output was actually mixed in with all the other stuff that was going on on the data bus, uh, making it a little confusing and a little bit difficult to distinguish our actual data from the, the other stuff that was going on. So what I want to do in this video is introduce our very first I.O. device, um, which will be an output device, which we can display our data on, um, which will then separate it from the, the data bus. So I'm going to introduce a new chip into this system. And that is going to be the DM9368N. So I'll just tell you a, a few things about this chip and why I selected this one in particular. Um, this is going to do three things for us in our system. I'm actually going to be displaying the data on a seven segment LED. Got one here. And now normally these require current limiting resistors. This is just an array of LEDs. Um, there's eight in total. They're called seven segment because of the, the seven segments that make up the digit. And then we also get the decimal point. Um, we'll, we'll be ignoring the decimal point. Um, and we'll just be using the seven segments. Now, normally we would be required to fit current limiting resistors, because um, if we drive too much current through this, we'll just burn out the LEDs. Um, and that's the first thing that this chip is gonna do for us. This is actually a driver chip, an LED driver chip, and it can actually generate uh, a constant current output, um, which eliminates the need for those um, resistors, those current limiting resistors. Now. There isn't a huge advantage because the current limiting resistors really don't cost much money, um, but they do take up space in the in the circuit on the on the circuit board. Um, you need seven for every digit, so even a three-digit display would require twenty-one resistors, and that's quite a lot of space on the on the circuit board. The second thing that this chip will do for us is it will actually decode and re-encode the signals. So from the data bus, we've got uh, essentially a binary number. And we can't just use that binary number to drive this um, seven segment LED. We have to decode that binary number and then re-encode it into the correct signals to generate the, the digit turning on each segment as required. So there's, there's two ways of doing that really. You can do it in software or you can do it in hardware. If you did it in software, you would probably have a lookup table. So you would look up the number you're trying to display and then map that onto a different set of signals for the for the LED. Um, and if you're going to do it in hardware, you'd, you would use a chip such as this. Um, the other thing that that gives us is um, if you were going to try and drive this LED directly, um, you would need seven data lines. Um, but by, by doing it through a chip such as this, um, we can only display uh, the digits on here um, 0 through to 9, or if it's hexadecimal like it is here, um, 0 through to F. Um, and that can all be encoded in just four bits of binary. So we only need four input signals on this chip to drive all seven, um, seven segments to drive all seven LEDs. So it does also reduce the, the number of lines that we actually need. And then the third thing that this chip does for us is it is actually a latch. Um, let me explain what I mean by latch. Um, we don't want to be sampling the data bus all the time and outputting the data onto this display. Otherwise we just have the same problem as we had last time. We'd be displaying everything that's happening on the data bus. We only want to display our output. So what we can do is there's a, a latch enable pin on here or an input enable pin. And when we drive that pin low, whatever, it, whatever signals are present on the um, input lines will get latched through to the output. Um, and then 
we can continue on processing. The data on the input lines can be changing and uh, we won't be um, displaying the, the data on this side. Be a little bit easier to understand when we see that in practice. But that is the mechanism that will allow us to separate out the data. We can decide when we pay attention to the data bus and when we ignore the data bus. So three main functions. It's a latch, it's an encoder, and it's a driver. So that, that's the reason I chose this chip. Okay, let's have a look at the data sheet for this to see how we hook it up. So this is the data sheet. Um, seems to be manufactured by Fairchild. I'm not sure if my actual chips are. Um, maybe manufactured by other people as well. Um, this is the pinout. I think we've got here... Um, Oh, it says logic signal and connection diagram. So I think this is the the one we want to be looking at. This data sheet isn't terribly clear. Um, we've got VCC on pin 16 and ground on pin 8. That's fairly conventional. They have them sort of opposite like that. Um, these pins all down this side are the seven segment LEDs. Um, they don't run in sequence, so we have to make sure we get them correct. It's a little hard to read this, but I think it's A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. I think G might be the um, decimal point that we're not going to use. But the seven segment displays are normally uh, numbered with the letters A through to F. Um, that's fairly conventional, so that should be straightforward. Um, on this side of the chip, again, a little hard to read. We've got uh, four input signal lines. We've got A0, A1, A2, and A3. And again, they're kind of dotted about all over the place, so we'll need to be careful with that. Um, and then there is a couple of uh, inputs and one output, I believe. Um, I think this is RBI, which is an input, and then RBO is an output. And this is um, input enable. I believe that's really not very very clear that is it well it's latch enable le it's called down here like le latch enable input active low um so this is the pin that we will use to decide when we latch the data um, when we grab the data off the data bus and move it into this device um i'm going to be hooking that up directly to the io request line on the Z80. So every time the Z80 wants to make an I.O. request, this chip will get latched. Um, in the future, we'll need to do something a little bit different with that, but that'll be fine for now. Um, we can connect our data lines A0 to A3. So that's the bottom four bits of the address bus directly to these A0 to A3 pins. So that's straightforward. So that only leaves the RBO and RBI. Now this is a feature called ripple blanking. Um, I'm, I'm not gonna explain that because I'm not gonna be using it, but you can always um, look into this chip yourself if you're interested. Um, and I believe it's used for sometimes with displays um, like leading zeros, we, we wouldn't actually want to display a zero. If we had the number five, we might not want to display that as zero five. We might just want to display just the five and the zero would be um, not displayed. And I think that's what this ripple blanking is, is for. It's to hide the leading zeros or trailing zeros on, on decimal numbers. Um, so quite a neat feature actually, and I would like to explore that, but it's not relevant to this project, so I'm not gonna go into that. So it looks um, fairly straightforward to hook up. Just one other thing that I really want to mention Seven segment decoder driver designed to drive seven segment common cathode LED display. So that was the point I wanted to make. Um, this is only good for driving common cathode LEDs. So we need to make sure that we are using the correct LED display. It's no good for common anode, just, just common cathode. Um, it does say that um, the, the LED display should be rated at a nominal 20 milliamps. Um, that's fairly standard, so I think we're going to be okay with that, although it's reasonably high current. Okay, let's let's hook it up. Okay, so I've made some of the connections already. All the white cables here are connected to the LEDs. 
So that's A through to G, I think the letters are. Um, I don't think this chip actually drives the, the decimal point. I think that has to be done independently. It just drives the seven segments. Um, you just have to be careful that you, you get these hooked up to the, the correct segments on the LED. Um, the only other pin at the top of the chip is pin 15 is the VCC. So we'll hook that up to the positive. And the ground, I've connected the ground on the chip down to the, um, the ground rail on this breadboard. And then I've also connected um, the, the ground on the LED. Um, the center pins on the display, the, the top center pin and the bottom center pin are actually connected internally. So you can use either or the top center or the bottom center for the ground, because this is common cathode, so that common is the ground. Um, and then I'll need to hook up this uh, ground line onto our breadboard here. So we've got power and ground and all the LEDs connected up. Um, the next thing I will put in is the four data lines. Um, Got to get these in the right order. So that's A0. So I believe that is pin 7, uh, which should be there. And then we've got A1. And that is... Pin three, I've, no, that's pin one, pin one. And then we've got A2, is pin two. And A3 is pin six, I think, pin six. Next, we want that latch enable line. Um, apologize for the color. I'm going to use a black wire. Latch enable is pin three. So that's there. And that, like I said, I'm going to connect that directly to the IO request line on the Z80. And then just one other thing, because we don't want to use the ripple blanking feature, um, we can ignore the output. Generally, if you're not using an output, you can ignore it. For the input for the ripple blanking, I'm going to tie that high because I believe it's active low and we don't want to use it, so we tie it high. Um, just trying to look on the diagram which pin that is. I believe it's pin 5. So that would be this one. Hopefully I've got that right. So I'll just tie that high because we don't want that feature. Okay, now let's see what happens. Hope it doesn't go up in smoke. Let's connect the battery. Oh, I should just say I've swapped the um, resistor here on the clock. Um, this, this resistor and capacitor um, determine how fast the automatic clock runs. And I felt it was running a bit slow, so I've reduced the value of the resistor. I think I've got a 10K resistor in there now. I think I originally had 56k. I've swapped that out. Should be approximately four times faster now. Um, let's hook this up. Okay, we got an F on the display. That is a that's a um, little bit of a, a glitch. Um, I think when you you start up, you can't guarantee what um, state the the data lines are going to be in and. Um, th th there is a little bit more to it than I, I just didn't want to go into that topic and um, we should be able to ignore that. I think um, sometimes when you start the system up it doesn't have a clean reset and that is something we'll need to design into the system a proper power on reset circuit. Um, but for now I should just be able to press the reset button and let it go and hopefully we've got the A, 9, 8, seven, six, five. So you can see it's counting down. I'm not gonna count all those down. It's nearly there. Two, one, and then we see the halt light come on. So can you see that halt light? I'm not sure if you can see that. 
Um, so it's the exact same program we had running last time, um, but now we've got the, the data broken out. Um, let's slow things down again. Let's go back into manual clock. Um, reset and a few clocks to make sure we're reset. Let's start stepping through the program and watch what happens. Okay, so the first thing that happens is we load the number six onto the data bus because that's our first instruction that we've loaded from memory. And that is not our output. Our output line over here is not low. And therefore this output device we've built here is ignoring the data line. So this is the, the point I was trying to make about latching. Um, at the moment, we're not paying attention to the data line and nothing is coming onto our display. I know we've got the number one here on our display. That's kind of just how it started up. Um, if I step through, you can see the data line has changed and the point is nothing is changing over here. We keep stepping through. And somewhere here. I believe this is our first piece of data now on the data line, but the IO line hasn't gone low yet. It's gonna go low on the next clock cycle. And if we clock it one more time, we see that go low. And now the A, which is hexadecimal number 10, um, is transferred from the data bus onto our IO device. So that's the main point I'm trying to get across in this video. Um, that only happens when that I.O. line goes low. So if we continue to step through, the line has gone high again, so it will now start ignoring what's happening on the data bus. Notice that our data is still there, so there's there's no sort of timing conflict issues there. Um, all the time that our line was low, the data was here on the data bus. Now it moves on, it changes, and our display does not change. It keeps ignoring it, and we should get around to the next digit, which would be a nine. We should be able to spot that. That looks like it. There's uh, eight and one is nine. So again, it's not gone on here yet, but on the next clock cycle, we'll see the line go low. And there we go, and now the, the data goes onto the device. So that is kind of really what I wanted to get to in this video, but I thought I would take it uh, one step further and see um, if we could drive uh, two of these uh, um, seven segment LEDs. So I'm starting to get a little bit serious now. I've actually got a prototyping board here. It might be a little difficult for you to appreciate the size of it but compared to my hands. It's a reasonably big, um, board. It's not huge, but it should be big enough for this project. Um, so I've soldered in uh, two of these uh, displays and I've actually hooked them up to two of these chips. Now the wiring is all on the back. It is a little messy. Um, it is uh, tricky to do this stuff. Um, what I've got on this side um, I've got a 40 pin header here and I figured that we could break out all 40 pins of the Z80 onto this. Um, but this is just temporary. I've got plans for this board and I probably should sort of outline where we're going with this. Um, this is going to be um, what I call a trainer board. It's just for me to learn how the Z80 works and I can go through some of the concepts and show them in these videos of how the Z80 works so we can just learn how to use it using this board and then eventually we'll go on to the real computer where we will remove some of these things like the displays um, and we'll move on to that um, VGA signal output that we need to generate. Um, but for now, just so that we can keep progressing, I'm going to build it on this board. So what I'll need to do, I've got at the moment our EEPROM is really only driving one digit because we've got this set up here. So what I should be able to do is disconnect this temporary board. 
pull these out, we can get rid of that. And then we can bring in our larger display. I'll have to move things about a bit to fit them on the camera. Maybe I could. There we go. Um, now, the most difficult one for me to remember here is the IO request line. So I need to kind of make sure that is the right connection, which I believe is that one. That's that one there. So that's our IO request line. Let's get this back in the camera shot. Okay, so power is going to go on the very first connection. Ground on the next one. And then I've actually got the next eight connections are for the data bus. So they're, they're D0 to D7 is our data bus. So I'll connect up the first four for our first digit. So that's zero, one, two, three. And that should be all we need, which is fairly handy. It's just the, the data bus power and ground and the IO request line. Now if I hook up the battery, For now, just ignore this digit because it's, the, it's uh, not being controlled. Um, it's just happened to start it up in the, an F, but we can ignore that. Um, and also, you, you, you just can't guarantee what's going to happen at startup. We, we'll need to sort that out at some point. When the system actually runs at startup, that, that won't even be a problem. That's why I'm not too worried about it right now. Um, we should be able to put the clock back into auto mode. Didn't quite do that right, did I? Let's give it a reset. And let's run that. And hopefully we'll see uh, A, 9, 8, blah, blah, blah. Um, can we focus on that? Um, you might have noticed I switched to green LEDs, but it really doesn't make any difference. So we've got that counting down from A to 0, but it would be quite nice if we could control uh, both digits on here and count down from FF to zero, which would be the, the full range that we can do. But in order to do that, we're gonna to have to reprogram the EEPROM. Uh, it'll take a little bit of effort because I've got to dig it out of here, put it in the programmer and then get it back in here. So let me just adjust the program and we'll come back to this. So I have gone into the serial tools and if I select my port, should be able to connect. Got a prompt, that's good. Let's do D to dump. So there's our program. And I believe all we need to do is change uh, the second byte there. This is load B with a zero A, and we want to change it to load B with FF. So we need to poke. Let me just um, see if I can get these instructions up so poke takes an address five digit number i believe and then the data okay so if we poke zero 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 one it might not matter with those leading zeros and then if we change that to ff poke successful D to dump, yeah, it's changed the, the second digit there. So we've now got 06FF, and that should be all we need to do. So I can come out of this and we can put the ROM chip back into our system. Okay, so you can see it's counting down. Let me just reset the, the system, and it should start at FF. There we go. And it's counting down. Hold my hand here to put a bit of shadow on it so it's a bit sh easier to see on the video. Still a little bit slow, isn't it? We'll just see it count 
down to the zero and we should see it go to EF. And there we go, EF. So it is counting down now on both digits. Had a little mishap with the EEPROM. Uh, this is this is not going to work long term being buried under all of these cables here because we have to keep pulling it in and out. It's damaging the pins and I actually managed to snap one of the pins off so I had to solder a new pin onto the chip. But luckily it survived, it seems to be working. Um, I have ordered another ZIF socket so I can get a ZIF socket soldered onto here and then the programming should be a little easier. I could also now start transferring the, the other circuits here um, I'm definitely going to move the power supply over on, onto here. I've got a little jack there ready um, so we can use a 9 volt power supply on it so we can have it uh, plugged into the mains rather than off this little battery. Um, and I could, I suppose, transfer over the, the clock circuits and the, the reset circuits and get the Z80 on here. Basically everything, get everything moved over onto this uh, board. The only reason i'm holding a little bit back on that is because it's nice to be able to continue to prototype on the on the breadboards so i might not do all of that straight away but i will start to transfer some of the the circuits across uh, still counting down yeah so we've got our first uh, io device on the system um, I've not dealt with the I.O. addressing yet. What I'll do in the next video is I'll add another two sets of these. So we'll have uh, six LEDs in total. And we'll look at uh, how we can use another chip to, to do the I.O. Um, address decoding. And then we can um, tell our program that we want to output different data to different ports and that they will go to our different devices. So that'll be for the next video. So thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.